Uh, welcome in. This is part six. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are going through uh, Steve Farrar's book called Finishing Strong. And we, we continue to talk about what that, that means. That means that we're going to finish every part of our life. You know, we're going to, you know, if we've been called to be a husband, we're, we're going we're gonna to do that and finish that without a, a moral compromise. Uh, you know, where, whatever period of life we're in, we're going to finish that completely devoted to Jesus Christ. And we're walking through the different things to avoid. And also, what, like today, what we're going to learn is, you know, you can learn a lot from looking at the right example. But as Steve Farrar makes out, you can also learn a tremendous amount by looking at the wrong example. And uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about that today. But first, uh, we're going to open in prayer. We've got a number of men that are a, a, a part of our, our Bible study here, also part of our, our men's ministry uh, as a whole that, that have a lot for us to pray about today. Uh, so I'm going to include them in our prayers, and uh, you include them as well. So uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for that time together right now, Lord. I pray for uh, my brother in Christ, Jordy Henson, and his wife. As, uh, uh, as we are just finished this Bible study, they, they've just um, done the, the funeral service for Jordy's father-in-law, Kim's father, and laying this godly man to rest. We are thankful that it is a celebration. We pray for Bill Searcy that had uh, extensive surgery yesterday in his ongoing battle with uh, pancreatic cancer. The miracle that we are seeing is just tremendous, and we, we pray, Lord, that that will be fully a, a full healing for Bill, even though a lot had to be done yesterday. His recovery will be gruesome, and we pray, Lord, that you'll take him through that as even he lies in intensive care right now. But we're praising your name for what appears to be success in the surgery and hopefully a full recovery uh, for him, and of course, uh, we, we lay that at your feet today. Uh, Lord, we have other people that, of course, uh, uh, are struggling, and, and they've got things in their lives, Lord, that they're dealing with, and uh, so we pray for Scott Moss, who's also a, a member of our men's ministry, Lord, and, and the fact uh, uh, his father just passed, and I know that was a shock to that family, and, and I pray, Lord, that you'll be with them as you're always close to the brokenhearted. I uh, just had to uh, talk to one of our brothers in the Bible study before the Bible study who's got you know family members with all sorts of health issues, and he is a dad having to uh, stand there and take on you know two things with his children and also with his wife. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with him uh, over the next 24 to 48 hours as they wait for blood tests and have to have a surgery they have to go through. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to be with these men as you're with us today, as we uh, once again look to, to your word uh, for the things we should do, and also examples like today of the way we should not be. And we pray this order in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Diatroph diatrophices. Can y'all say it? Diatrophices. There it is. And, I, and, you know, and I did what I did. If I don't know how to say somebody's name in the Bible, I was once told this by somebody I won't mention. Go ahead and say it because most people in the room can't say it either. Diatrophices. Can y'all say it? Diatrophices. Not good Greek name. Uh, but anyway, what we have, the, 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 the chapter today is six, and I love this title. And I, I, I have been this way. Uh, I do not like people who are this way. Even though I know that I once was this way, I still don't like them. Uh, these are people. I don't like it as a coach. I don't like it as a businessman. I don't like it as a boss. I don't like it as a father. I would say I don't like it as a husband, but I'm afraid my wife will actually hear this uh, because I'm not saying this. I'm just saying you wouldn't like this, and she didn't like it either. Uh, and it's called unteachable, unaccountable, and unacceptable. Uh, and, and we know those kind of people. I, yeah, how many times, I don't know how many people have ever participated in sports. Uh, of course, I, you know, my, my dad's a retired coach. I've done some coaching. I'm coaching now. And I can't tell you how many times you say to somebody, hey, you got to be coachable. Man, you got to be coachable. And if you're not coachable and you're not teachable, uh, you are problematic. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. I also love John Ruskin's quote that starts off the chapter. When a man is wrapped up in himself, he makes a pretty small package. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. And, and so I like when, when Steve starts off this chapter and, and he says, you know, you remember, how many remember the campaign he was talking about, about uh, the Uncola? Does everybody remember that? Seven Up, the Uncola? Um, I thought that was, uh, all, I, I agree with you guys, that that was a, um, a very good campaign because you didn't forget it. So what he's saying is we talk a lot about leaders, but today we're going to talk about the unleader, and that is diatrophies. Something like that. Uh, but anyway, so, so if you remember this. He was talking about when he was a young man, and Steve said, you know, I, they, they said, go to a character, find something in the Bible you don't know about, and write about a character that you have never really heard of. And he went to uh, Third John and found this man, Diotrophices. And uh, he was a man that was wrapped up uh, in himself, just as we were just talking about with the quote. 
And he says, we can so sometimes learn more from one negative role model than a half a dozen of positive ones. He said, this man, Diotrophices, is a classic prototype for a young would-be leader. And he says, if you look at this young would-be leader, this example, one thing that would be very simple for all of us, if you're looking to be a leader, look at Diotrophices and do the opposite. And uh, he, he said, this is, he's a classic wannabe. I want to be a leader, but I'm not really a leader. And uh, one of the things that, that, I, that I looked at when I was looking at this, um, this very small book of the Bible and this letter from John, I thought it was interesting when you look at these few verses that talk about him, that, and we, we'll get to this later, these letters that came from the apostles were usually read to the church. And, and he talks about what it must have been like for this man to sit here and he can't wait for the letter. And all of a sudden he goes, I'd like to address diatrophies. And he's probably sitting there right now. And, uh, and he does not address him with, with very, very many things that are positive. Um, uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks says this, a leader is someone who leads. Now, have, have you ever thought about this? Because he said, you know, I like Steve. Steve speaks our language. Speaking of Steve Farrar, who wrote the book, he says, I want to come up with definitions and things that I can grasp and I can learn. And, and I, I, well, I see this a lot. You know, these are the people that we call a self-proclaimed leader. You know, I have a title, therefore that means I'm a leader. Uh, but Steve Farrar, quoting uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks, says, title does not equal leader. You're only a leader if you actually lead. So you can be a self-proclaimed leader, but if we look at your life and we do not see you leading, or we don't see anyone following, then you're not a leader. If you say, well, I'm the spiritual leader of my home, but then we got inside your home and we talked to your wife and talked to your children and, and we couldn't find any evidence that, that they were following you or that you had led them in any way, shape, or form, you might declare yourself the spiritual leader, but the evidence would show that you're really not. Or, you know, maybe you're in some leadership at work or you're at some leadership in church or you're some leadership uh, with, a, with a youth team or wherever you may be. Uh, just because you've declared yourself a leader doesn't mean that you are one. We've had plenty of people that we all, as the, the, in a constitutional republic, we've gone out and voted them a leader, but that didn't make them a leader. Uh, they were only a leader if they actually led. And so that, that, so, so that is a, a definition that I want us today to mark down. If we want to be a leader, you'll know you're a leader when you actually lead. And, uh, and, and we, yeah, you're, be careful of these people that always, if they can ever find a way to give themselves a title, be real careful of that. That's usually, now there, I'm sure there's you know, some exceptions, but most of the time those people rarely are leaders. You know, like, like, hey, we got together and I've decided that I'm going to be the guy who heads this up. Or I'm going to be the guy that, you know, I'm, I'm always going to be the head coach of the team. Not that anybody wants me to be, I've declared myself the head coach of the team. And, you know, and hey, I, I started a company, so I'll make myself president of the company, but but none of that means you're a leader. You're only a leader if you lead. So he talks about when we look at the, the, this man in, in, in Third John, um, uh, if you have that or something you know, uh, that you want to write it down, uh, we're talking about verses 9 and 10 because I can really read the whole thing because it's, it's not a very long book of the Bible. So it starts out, John is saying, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I, I love in truth, but beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly with the brothers as they came and testified to your truth as indeed you were walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Hey, hey, we are rolling. This is sounding good. Everybody's excited. I mean, how about Gaius is going, you know, he gets a prop from John, said, I'm hearing good things about what's going on. He said, beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You would do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Still going good. Here we go, verse 7. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. Hey, Gaius, I'm hearing some good things. There's some folks there among you. They're doing good. Hey, I'm hearing the way they're handling themselves out there. This is good. We need to be sure we're supporting them. Then verse 9. Now, picture Diotrophices sitting in the church. Picture him sitting there. And, and somebody's reading the letter from the Apostle John. You know, John's in the inner circle with Jesus. It's a big deal to get a letter from John. Then here comes nine. I have written, written something to the church, but Diophatry, 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 
Dio, no, Diophatries, who likes to put himself first, does, does not acknowledge, acknowledge our authority. So first of all, John says, now the apostles, we know what's going on. Well, as, as, as Greg would call him in a company, we know that inside the church body, we've got an empty skimp. That, that was a word for somebody who's working against you behind the scenes. He knows, I know this guy likes to put himself first, and he doesn't acknowledge the authority of the apostles. So if I come, I will bring, uh, he said, I will bring up what he's doing. Now, I like that. John says, I'm not just going to write it here. If I can get to you, I'm going to talk about this with him face to face in front of everybody. He's, he's in good company, isn't he? You remember Paul didn't have a problem with that at all. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Hmm. So we have a guy here that is an unleader in the church, and the apostle John says, I want you to know that I'm aware of what's happening and I will tell you some problems that I have with him. And Steve Farrar says, so really, if you look at these few verses, John gives us five marks of, of what it looks like to be an unleader. That's not a leader. This is an unleader. First of all, he says an unleader is an unservant. He said, he, said, he said, I want you to think about this. Look at what he says here in verse 9 and 10. He lets everybody know that he always wants to be first. Look what he says. He says, look, this guy likes to put himself first. He does not acknowledge our authority. So the first thing, that means he's not a servant leader. He wants to be recognized. He wants to be first. And, and, and he says that I will. Be, he's not a servant. He's actually an unservant. So an unleader would also be an unservant. Look at, Think about what, the, what Mark said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 35. If you want to write that down, Mark 9, 35. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and a servant of all. That, uh, that comes from, from Jesus. Matthew 18, 4. Write that down. Matthew 18, 4. Who, whoever then humbles himself as this child, remember when Jesus did something that was really uh, you know, counterculture. Jesus is always counterculture, no matter what culture he's in, including today. And in that culture, you did not make a fuss over children, and you certainly didn't put them in the middle of a bunch of adults, and you certainly didn't put, take that child and let attention go to the child off the teacher. But Jesus says, I'm counterculture. Let me have this child. He sits him right in the middle of everything. And he says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, uh, he said, becomes great. And, uh, and he, he says, among you, uh, if you really want to be great, this is in now Matthew 20, 26 through 28, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right, so I'm just grabbing a couple of verses. We see that this man that's sitting here in this church this is after Jesus has done his earthly ministry. This is after Jesus has ascended. Uh, so you assume that everybody's talking about the things that Jesus said. We have them, of course, documented in the gospel. But even then, you, you think, well, they know the things that Jesus taught, right? Well, here's this guy claiming he's the leader of some church body. And the first thing that John says about him is he is not like Jesus. Because Jesus clearly told all of us, if we want to lead, you serve. So I want to make sure you understand that the type of leadership that is called in the, in the Word of God to everybody within the sound of my voice that desires to lead, the leadership that is called by Jesus Christ is counterculture. And if you remember, Jesus was even, remember, remember the time that Jesus is talking to what I say the first, the first team mom in biblical history, and that's John's mama. John's mama and James' mama. Now, keep in mind, right now, when John goes off on diatrophies here, he's a little more sons of thunder again. He's back to his old nickname here. But you know, call James and John the sons of thunder. That, that probably didn't mean they were passive guys. But if, if you recall, their mama went to Jesus and said, now tell me that my sons are going to be on your left and your right. So that, that's the first team mom. She comes to Jesus and says, now I want my sons to be a big deal in your ministry. And um, I want my son to play quarterback. And so... And Jesus said, what? Be careful what you're asking. Because he said, the way we see leadership, the people who follow me, and that would be his church, the way we see leadership is not like the pagans. He said, the pagans, they, like to, they say leadership means that you're, it's tyrannical, that, that you're in power and you oppress 
those that you're in leadership over. He goes, that's not my kingdom. My kingdom is going to be different. He says, my kingdom, if you really want to be first, you have to be last. If you want to lead the way I lead, then you would give yourself up as a ransom. He's talking about the crucifixion at this time. And he says, so we serve those that we are placed in leadership over. Counter culture. We're not like the pagans. And frankly, I see a lot of people who claim to be Christians who lead like pagans. You know, they, 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 they do not, they, they will ask people to do things they're not willing to do. They do hoard over people. They do puff themselves up. They do want to be first. They do want to be acknowledged. They do want to be treated differently than the people they've been placed in leadership over. And uh, I've told you that before. You've heard the story many times. If there's one thing my father taught me in leadership, it was servant leadership. My father is the, one of the most humble people I've ever known, and he never asked anyone that he was in leadership over to do anything that he was not willing to do, not just say he would do, but actually do. And that included, as I told you the story many times, of him when he was the athletic director and head football coach cleaning the toilets because he told the person who asked him why he was doing that, he said, because it's my turn. You think people won't run through a wall for a guy like that? So uh, you probably don't have people running you down behind your back in, in that situation. So remember that Christian leadership is counterculture because I love this, and this is going to be our quote today as we put out this podcast. Some of you read it as you clicked on it. Christian leadership is giving your best without having to be first. And da, 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 uh, Dio why can't we have a regular name? Can I call this guy Dan? Uh, Diotrophes. Di, di, uh, anyway, he, he says, first of all, John says about him, look, he wants to be first. That's, that's his calling card. And he loved to be first. He enjoyed being a big shot. He loved special privileges. And he liked to impress people. You know this guy. We, we all been around this guy, haven't we? Hmm? I, hope, I hope it's not you. I hope if I went to a circle of people that knew you that they would say, well, you're, the, you're that guy. You know, you like to be a big deal. You want to be first. You want to be recognized. And, and you want everybody to know that you're in charge. And how about this? Just like this. And if somebody else, like John, think about how ridiculous that is. Think about how ridiculous this guy is. He's running down John. And keep in mind, he says, not only is he running me down, he's running all the apostles down. He claims that we don't have the authority that Jesus gave us. Why? Why do you think he says that? Because he wants, him, he wants to be first. He don't want even think, anybody to think that John's a bigger deal than him. Now, I think that is also incredibly delusional. But I don't know if y'all have looked around lately. People that can be quite delusional. And, 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 and I will tell you this. We're all a little bit delusional, but there's some people that are wacky delusional. And, uh, and, and I would think this cat is delusional if, he, if he's offended that people think John writing him a letter is a big deal or John coming to see the church is a big deal. He's like, no, I'm the big deal. So what does he do to be sure you think he's the big deal? And y'all have seen this. He runs down the person that everybody thinks is a big deal. If somebody gets excited about somebody more than him, like a spoiled little child, he cuts them down. He's undermined them. And, he, and John says this. Look, look what John says he's doing. He says he, he is, um, he says he wants to be first and he does not acknowledge our authority. And he goes on to say what? And he's talking wicked nonsense against us. So he's saying things about us that aren't true to try to make himself look better. Be careful, by the way, if you're ever that arrogant. If you're going to run somebody down, you might want to pick somebody that has, doesn't have the reputation of like the Apostle John. Okay. You might want to pick somebody that maybe somebody might listen to you on. You know, somebody goes, oh, really, you got an issue? What's going on? I tell you, I don't like that John. You're talking about the guy in Jesus' inner circle? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about him. I don't know if we should listen to him. Y'all better listen to me. So think how ridiculous that is, by the way. But that's what an unleader does. If I desire, look, look this all, this, now we're assessing ourselves. So I don't want to be diophytes, diophytes. I don't want to be this guy, and I want to be Jesus, then I love this. This is important. So this, this is one of those, today, this is where you, uh, you underline this because this is going to be one of those things you're not going to answer right now. You have those questions? you got questions you can answer immediately. Then you got questions you circle and go, i got to get back to that one. So if you don't want to be like this guy, if you don't want to be like the unleader, but you want to be like the ultimate leader, Jesus, you're going to have to make some drastic changes. It's drastic. It's extreme 
I hope y'all don't, don't, if you don't get anything else out of the, the Bible studies and the process we're going through to, to try to disciple men and be discipled. Because as you're being discipled, I'm being discipled. I'm saying we, not you. If we want, if you don't get anything else out of this, we are not putting ourselves in another run of, run of the mill cultural Christianity Bible study that is that is that, that requires some minor changes. If you want to be like Jesus and I want to be like Jesus, it will require radical, drastic changes. It's counterculture. You're not going to fit into the culture at all. I mean, we must respond, especially in leadership, in ways that people go, wow, where did, that doesn't even, nobody does that. That's right. They don't. I guess we're part of the few. I, I got a chance to speak at a church on Sunday. They're implementing the strategy of what we've been trying to implement for, with their men's ministry, and they had a great kickoff, and it was so well done, and they, they did a tremendous job. But one of the things that, that we were talking about is that if we want to take this and change it, then we're going to have to do things that we've never done before. We're not going to be like the rest of the world. And, and, when, and if you're not willing to do that, then you probably can't be part of it. And I said, I believe, which I believe with you, I believe with me, I believe with every man, if we were being honest, if we would just tell men the truth about what Jesus actually said, men would be all in. What we've done, we've, we've lowered the standard and we've softened uh, discipleship and following Jesus and made it so, it's not, it's not radical, it's not drastic. And you know what? The way God made men, you know what they say? Well, then what, what's the use? What value is this? Anybody can do it. No. Jesus can change anybody. That's absolutely true. But, but what Jesus actually said is that the road was wide and easy that leads to destruction. That's what he said in Matthew 7. The road is wide and easy. Don't miss wide and don't miss easy and don't miss the next one. And those that are on that road are many. So wide, easy, many is actually the road to destruction. But then there's a narrow gate that is hard and only a few find it. Now, if you tell me in that, God made you and me in a way that said, oh, really? So not many will make it. Absolutely not. I'm in. I'm in. And that's what Jesus actually said. Now, sometimes you go to the Western church, and you think, well, this looks like it's just for, I mean, man, ain't nothing to this. I come here, sing a few songs. I, you know, go out and serve and go feed some people and go downtown and, you know, go rebuild a few houses and do some good social work and then just live my life like everybody else. And I guess that's all there is to this Christian thing. Y'all do realize the lost can build houses. And we should, don't misunderstand me. But y'all realize lost people can feed people and build houses and get clean water filters. And we should do these things. Now, don't you go tell somebody, Rick, that we don't do these things. But if you're just doing it because it's some kind of code of conduct and that's kind of a nice thing to do, there's certainly people that don't care about people. But, you know, even a pagan can say, this looks like a bad situation, I should help. But a pagan still lives a life of rampant sin. What Jesus has called us to is certainly works come from this, but what he's called us to is holiness. And that's drastic. And that's radical. And I ain't there yet. But I'm working on it. What, you, Rick, are you trying to do works? No, no, no. I'm just trying to get, I want to know everything about Jesus. I want, I want to consume Jesus, and I want to know everything about the power that he affords anybody who's willing to, hey, don't you love when Jesus says, y'all don't miss this. This is important. If you seek me, you'll find me. Okay, so he didn't say, if I just sit in my chair and wait on him, he'll find me? No. I know there's some theology like that out there. But that ain't what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you seek me, you'll find me. So if you ain't found Jesus because you ain't looking for him, he's not hiding himself from anybody. He's not, he's not stiff-arming anybody. It's like the prodigal son. What would the dad say? Look, let me just see you top that hill, and I'll run the rest of the pasture. And I'm bringing, get, hey, get out the rings, get out the, 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 the best coats, let's kill the fatted calf. You're like, well, is this is the prodigal son? Is it you going to wait on the porch? No, no, no. Jesus is coming. But guess where we had to do first? We got to come top that hill. I'm seeking you. Well, then I'm coming. 
So if you haven't been transformed by Jesus, it's on you. It's on me. It ain't on him. Because he said, if you seek me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my, I'll make you fully righteous and you can have me in my fullness. And I'll give you my presence called the Holy Spirit that raised me from the dead. And that ain't changed nobody. <laughs> well, if you ain't been changed, it ain't because of the lack of power for Jesus. I'll tell you that. And I speak from that. So, it, so if we want to be more like Jesus and not like the unleader, then it's going to be drastic. And again, you can't answer that for me today. You've got to circle that and you've got to go spend some time alone and you've got to do some prayer and you've got to say, boy, I, I tell you, that stuck with me today. So, so if I want to be like Jesus, I've got to make drastic changes. Yes, you do. Yes, I do. And, and, and nothing, by the way, you don't, don't, we can't have this attitude of a life of a follower of Jesus where we can be made into a true leader, which means we're ready to serve the kingdom of God. There can't be, and this happened in my own life, the process of radical change happened for me when I said everything is on the table. Because you know what happens we do a lot of times? Jesus, you can have some of my life, but not all of it. Everything's on the table. Take it. Whatever's here that is, that is between you and me, get rid of it. If I'm in the wrong profession, move me. Hey, if, if, we're, if the way I'm spending my money is wrong, change it. It's yours. What do you want me to do with it? If, if, I'm supposed to, if I'm supposed to answer a call on my life that I, you know, hey, I, I'll, I'll do anything for you, but not this. Don't you call me into missions. Don't you call me to some downtown whatever. Don't call me to that. I'll do anything for you except this. Well, then you, he, you'll never be that leader. And I don't know what he's going to call you to. I don't know who's going to call me to. I have no idea, but I tell you what you can't do. You don't sit down and make deals with the great I am. You're either in or you're not. And then if you're not in, say, hey, teach me to be in. You know? I, I, I was talking to, a, you got to start, I was talking to a player last night, and God love him, he's a phenomenal athlete, but being a phenomenal athlete don't mean you're a good lacrosse player. I mean, you're incredibly athletic. But you ain't real good with the stick. So you beat everybody to the ball, but then you can't get it for me. You know, and I said, so what we got to do is figure out what you can do to help the team right now. We gotta, you got to play within yourself. You're trying to be the same player, this kid that's, that's going to play for the Tar Heels, man. He's been playing lacrosse a long time. You've just been playing two years. So, yeah, you're on the team, but right now you got to play within yourself. And listen, you help us the way you can now, and then next year, through the sanctification process would be in our walk, we'll be able to give you more responsibility. But right now, you're losing the ball for us because you're trying to be something you're not. You're not ready for this part of the game yet. Play the part of the game you're ready for. Master this, and then I'll take you to the next thing. What did Jesus say? If you want to show me you can be trusted with big things, show me you can be trusted with little things. And so that's the attitude that we have to have, and it is going to be a drastic... You know what some of you are, and I was just the way too? You're afraid to go there. I mean, we, we got a brother that I'll send this to today. You know why he can't come to the Bible study anymore, part of the reason? Because he actually told God that he would, he would do whatever job he called him to, and he said, he said I knew the minute I prayed it, he's going to take that job away that I love and put me on something else. And I said, so what happened? He took my job away and put me on something else. He goes, and I knew that was coming because there was something about what he was doing before this that he couldn't get where he needed to be with Jesus, so Jesus took it away. When did he take it away? When the guy sincerely said, take it away if you need to. Right. Now, he's still with us. He's still listening to the Bible. Says, but he can't come here anymore because the job doesn't allow it now. But he's still there. But, he's, but see, it's better for you to be under the complete will of God than to be anywhere else. Because he's going to honor that. So, so are you willing to be that drastic? And some of you are afraid to put your yes on the table. We've been talking about that a lot at church lately. You're afraid to put your yes on the table because you think he's going to take it. Because you're saying, I don't want to go to hell, but please don't change my life. I like my life just like it is. <clears throat> That's not drastic. That's not radical. And you know what else? You're never going to be at peace. I found that out about Jesus. I love Jesus so much. But anytime I think that I've gone far enough, please don't bother me about this, I, he, he won't stop bothering you about it. There's no greater freedom to be under the perfect will of God so you can go to sleep at night. And he'll quit bothering you about it. He loves you enough to bother you to get you where you're supposed to be. Because believe it or not, 
No matter what it is, he's right. Man, go ahead and learn this now. Jesus is right. God's right. You're not. The more I learn about God, what? The more I learn I'm not him. And, and you know what? And he's right. So we know that that. So the first thing is if you're going to be an unleader, then you got to be, you can't be an unservant. You got to serve those that you've been placed in leadership over. And how about this? We are called to serve, bottom line. And then for our ask a question, this is another one. This is not one you can answer for me today. You got to go home. Are you willing to do drastic things to be a true servant leader? And then the question that really should be first, not trying to tell Steve what to do, I think this one should be first. Do you want to change? Do you want to? I don't know the answer to that. You know, one of the great, one of the worst things any man can say at any point in his life is, I'm good. Do you want to change? Are, are you at the point that you think, I'm good. I can't think of one thing I need to change. Do you want to change? That's another thing you have to answer for yourself. I can't answer that for you. The next one we just talked about too. An unleader is unteachable. Look, that, that, what, you said, what's he talking about this guy saying he's unteachable? Look what he says. So if I come, I'll bring up what he's doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brother. So first of all, he says, I can tell you right now in these verses, this guy's not teachable. He does not accept what we say. You know this guy? This is, I mean, guys, can you imagine, would you think I was an absolute loon if you said, Rick, what's going on? You look kind of down. I just, I had a meeting with John. Back to what we said, mate. You talking about the big three? Jesus, Peter, John. Is, is he, what? Are you talking about Peter and John? Peter and John, John? Yeah, James's brother. <laughs> and uh, I, I tell you, he said some stuff to me today. I just think it's garbage. I just think that. Hey, here's what he says we need to do and what I need to do. And I just think he's wrong. I, he don't know what he's talking about. So the changes he said you need to make, you're not going to make? Nah. I'm good. You know, I don't know about him. Always under, you know, not giving any credibility, you know, because you haven't said what you, what the person wanted you to say. See, being coachable and being teachable is not waiting on someone to say what you want to do. Right? And, and I can tell you, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to deal with something not near as important, but as a coach, and just finally say, hey, I can't trust you because you're not coachable. I, I, I lo don't you love those people? If you've ever been to a place of leadership, that by golly, if you say, I, I want the angle to be, I want, I want there to be about a 40 degree angle, and then I want you to go 10 yards, and I want you to cut it, and I want you to come right, get, get on this side of the linebackers and inside the DBs, and I want you to come right here, and I want you to squat right there in that space. Perfect. They're coachable. But then you got the idiot that runs his own route. <laughs> And you're like, yeah, and you're like, hey, man, that, that's, that's exactly not what I said to do. <laughs> well, I, well here, here's what I thought, right? Here, well, here's what I was thinking. I, I, look, I got in a world of trouble one time, and God punished me. I nearly broke my neck because I decided that we should block a punt, even though the coach didn't call block. <laughs> and I got upended by the, by the up back and landed right on top of my head. And the coach says, what are you doing right here? I said, man, I thought I could get it. He said, well, obviously... <laughs> You were incorrect. He kept running the film back in my head, kept you know, like this. And uh, he said, who told you to go? I said, nobody. I said, but I thought I could get it. He said, but that ain't what we said, is it? We got return on, don't we? We do. We do. He said, won't you turn around and tell the guy that got jacked by the guy you didn't block? Tell him you thought you could get it. And uh, so, But you got, you got to be coachable. And have, we never outgrow being told what to do. Everybody okay with that? You, never, you ain't never old enough and can't nobody tell you what to do. Where did you get that? We're never too old to be told what to do. Great leaders know how to submit to authority. And um, so I love this story he tells about meeting the young couple. Do you remember that? Or the young woman, I'm sorry. He met the young woman, and the young woman asked Steve Farrar uh, what she should look for in a husband. And he said, you know, I thought for a minute what I needed to tell her, and he was, he was with his wife, and and he said, but it just came to me. He said, find a man that's teachable. Find a man that will listen to your input. Find a man that will humble himself before the Lord. F find a man that's teachable, that doesn't think he knows everything. That's so humble that he actually will let his wife have input in his life. 
that maybe he'll come to the conclusion that sometimes you actually are right and he's wrong. And, and, and that, he, that he will humble himself ultimately before the Lord. And, and I mean, it's just, it's just like when you, when you talk about, you know, someone who's, you know, when any, any struggle you've ever had in your life, you know, have you ever tried to work with somebody and you're trying to help them? And, and he says that the thing that we have to be able to do if, is to look at somebody and say, hey, I got trouble with fill in the blank. And somebody says, okay, so that's your problem. Yeah, let me tell you what we need to do. And then you just totally disregard it. And you keep, you keep how many of you, raise your hand, and I, mine's already up. How many of you have disregarded someone's teaching before and had a terrible result? Okay. Why? Why wouldn't we listen? Yeah, I thought we knew better. Thought, 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 we thought to ourselves, well, that, oh, I love this one too. Well, let's not get crazy. <laughs> you know, I actually had that conversation with someone, and Steve talks about this, about the alcoholic in here. I mean, hey, you can't, you can't be around alcohol. Don't, don't go where there's alcohol. Well, that's a little extreme. <laughs> it's really not, considering that, that you, you can't drink. I mean, that, if I can't drink, then you know where I don't need to be? Where there's drink, Right? Don't, don't don't put, you know, well, we're trying to show how much self, self-control I'm going to have today. Is that what it is? It's a pride thing, isn't it? It's back to that thing again, the greatest sin of all time. So, so an unleader is not coachable. He's not teachable. Number three, an unleader is unjust. You ever been around this guy? John tells us this guy's making accusations that are unjust. He said un, uh, a bad leader, an unleader, creates an atmosphere of, of, of destruction, not construction. Uh, you said people usually do better in a leader who builds people up versus tearing them down. Have you ever been with that kind of leader? You ever been under that kind of boss? I have. They're unjust. They're not going to do things. They're not looking for justice. They're, they're a tyrant. And you say things like, well, that's not fair. That's not really, you're not being fair. And they create this atmosphere. I can remember so vividly being under a, a leader at one time that was so much this way that we would all come to work and we would literally be terrified about what kind of mood the guy was in. And you start trying to get some information. Hey, you've been by his office. You know what we'd say? How's the weather? Cloudy. <laughs> Stormy. And we go, all right, make a note. We're all, we're all going down today. There'll be no justice. We're going to be accused of something. You know what I mean? And then you'd ask, how's today? Sunny. Sunny today. And you think, okay, so today, may, maybe today he'll be fair. Who, who lives in that kind of atmosphere? It's, it's destructible. You think anybody wanted to win for that guy? Anybody? How many resumes do you think went out a day? Oh, i got to have a paycheck, but let me tell you something. As soon as I can get out of here, you know what I mean? Because nobody wants to work in that environment, right? You, you ever been in that environment? Yeah. <laughs> so, so and, and it's destructible. It's, it, 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 it's not constructive. It's destructive. You know, people, you know, when most, and this is one thing my dad taught me, there's nothing wrong with you if you're in a leadership position of saying, we got things we're going to do and things we're not going to do. Here, we have the list of things that shouldn't happen and the things that can't happen. And I will certainly fire somebody if I need to. Okay, but I'm, I'm going to be fair about it. I'm not going to just go off the handle and run somebody off because I'm having a bad day. That's not justice. I'm going to sit there and say, and I've had to do this before. Not many, praise the Lord, but I've had to do this before going, let me make out the case for, for the times that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. I'm going to remember the one incident we had where we had a client here and, and this happened. I'm going to show you that the decision I'm about to make today is just. I'm not going to say just because I'm the boss and I can fire whoever I want. First of all, by the way, loggers will see you after that. But it's also, not, it's also not the thing to do as a Christian in leadership. We have to make hard decisions sometimes, sure. But, but we got to be just about it, and we have to make a case that we judged fairly. Well, see, this guy, he's an unleader. He's making accusations that aren't even true. We certainly can't accuse people of doing things they didn't do. And we better have evidence that it actually happened, and we always what give people the benefit of the doubt, right? Now, we may find that what we think happened absolutely happened, and then you got to deal with it. But we must always hand down justice just like we're thankful, right? What, what people say this about God. I'll go this far. I don't even like the word fair. I like the word just because i got bad news for you. If we want God to be fair, we should all go to hell. 
I'm just glad he's just. You don't forget, Jesus did have to be crucified horribly on the cross. Something did have to happen. And, and so why do we call him Savior? Because there's something we have to be saved from. And if, and if, and if, if God's wrath is not going to be justifiably handed out on sin, then why did this have to happen to Jesus? So he's just. I, I like just over fair, because fair, we want to talk about it being fair. What we did to God, it's not fair to him what he had to do to his son. I'm just glad he's just. And, and so we should lead the same way. Uh, unjust words, and he said, don't do this if you're a dad or you're a boss or whatever. He said, uh, the family you come from is not as important as the family you're going to have. I like that one. Hey, guys, come off the excuse that you had a bad family. Sorry that happened. Uh, it certainly can be redeemed. Wish it hadn't happened to you. Wish everybody had a great family. I got news for you. We all didn't. And, and, but we're not held captive to the family that we came from. What's important is what kind of family we're going to create. And under the redemption of Jesus Christ, we can all be redeemed to do a better job than maybe your daddy did. Can somebody say amen to that? Okay. You know, we're supposed to be generation breakers, man. We, we don't just continue that garbage through generations. We break that. We, we're generation breakers, okay, under the power of Jesus. You know what? Whether, whether we know it or not, Dad sets the tone for the atmosphere in the home. Uh, same thing with coaches. I mean, I, I said this to a young coach last night. He says, hey, can you help me te learn how to be a coach? Because he knows a lot about the game, but he don't know anything about coaching. And I said, well, that's perfect. I don't know much about this game, but I know a little bit about coaching. And I said, so you tell him the stuff I don't know, and I'll try to teach you the stuff I know. It works out good. So, so anyway, he was asking me last night, and I said, just be careful. I said, don't, you can't lose it. He said, what do you mean? I said, you watch. This team will take on your personality. He goes, that's right. Teams do take on the personality of the coach, don't they? They do. You know what, what homes do? They take on the personality of dad. You ever been in one of those houses where everybody has to walk on eggshells because dad's a tyrant? Dad's not just. He's unjust. He's unpredictable. Boy, those are bad houses to be in. And sadly, some of you may live in a house like that. But don't do that to your kids. Don't do that to your wife. And, and, and so what we're saying is we set the tone in the house. I mean, and you set the tone at work. I hope... I hope everybody that works for me, if you ask them, say, you know, Burgess isn't 100 percent, and some days I don't think what he does, does is right, and, and I don't like everything that he does because he's not perfect, but our atmosphere at work is that atmosphere that we like to work in. You know, we're not living in fear that he's going to come in, and because he and his wife had a bad night last night, he's going to take that out on us. You know why? Because when I come through those doors, I don't do a lot of things right, but I'll tell you what I do. I'll, I'll promise you this. I'll come through those doors and be a pro. I'm not bringing my baggage in here and dump it off on everybody else. If I got something else going on, I'll handle it, I'll deal with it, but that ain't your fault and you shouldn't pay the price for that. When I come to work, I got to be a pro. And when I'm in my house, if there's something going on between me, my wife and I, we don't take it out on the kids. And if there's something going on between the kids you don't like, you don't take it out on the wife. Or if there's something going on at work, you don't bring that to your wife. If there's something going on with your wife, you don't bring that to work. That'd be a good rule for all of us. Don't take your garbage home and don't bring your home garbage to work. Because when we get here, it's time to be a pro. And we get home, it's time to serve and love. And certainly we serve in the leadership role no matter where we are. But if we can learn how to do that, we'll be a true leader. And uh, he, when Farrar told that terrible thing about unjust words, you know, don't ever say to anybody that, that is under your authority or especially your children, you'll never amount to anything. You know, your kid don't know how to do something as well as you know how to do it. You get frustrated and say, just give me the wrench, I'll do it. God, are you, are you idiot? Man, that, kids don't ever forget that kind of stuff. They don't ever. Do you, I bet you ain't forgot it, have you? If it happened to you. I mean, you'd be 50-something years old, you ain't forgot it. I, I, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because I remember having to explain to my kids, and this is one thing you can do if you want to be a, a, a leader like um, Jesus called us to be. See, he's perfect, we're not. Always come clean to your children and to your wife when you mess up. And if, you're, if, you, if you work somewhere and you're in leadership at work or leadership anywhere, if you mess up, tell the people that, that you've been put the leader over, tell them you messed up. Come back inside and say, I didn't handle that real well yesterday. That was wrong. I, that you wouldn't believe the good that that, don't be surprised that you can't admit that you were just wrong. You know, that, that, that also shows a side of you that people want to win for you. And they go, you know what, he didn't, he, he, you know, we all thought he handled that wrong yesterday. He just admitted it. But there's some people you can get them, couldn't get them. They don't even think, they're like Fonzie. I don't know if they can say they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, they can't even say it. It's okay to say, hey, I take ownership of this. This is on me. 
As a matter of fact, if you're in leadership, it ought to be on us first. And at home, the same way. Hey, I don't know how this house has got so chaotic. That's on me. But, but I was with my kids, and I, it was two of, my, two of my sons, and I was teaching one of them how to shoot. Some of y'all know the story. And I had the other one with me, and I clearly said, when, you, when, you, when you're trying to know how close to be to the scope, as soon as you can see, stop. Don't, don't get too close to the scope because it's going to come back and hit you in the head when it kicks. And you put it firm on your shoulder, it's going to kick you in the face. Right? You got me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and, of course, he shoots, and it hits him in the head. And he's cut his head. Now, if I was honest, my first concern was not for the kid, just being straight up. My first concern is I'm never going to hear the end of this from my wife. Oh. <laughs> I'm never going to hear the end of this. All I can think about is please don't let there be stitches. Please don't. What were you doing? What were you telling him? Did you, did you not hold? You know, we all know what's going to happen. I should care about my kid. What I really cared about is my day's over. <laughs> my, my, I was going to come home with camo pictures and rifles, and now I've got, I've got a bleeding head and people screaming and crying. And the first thing I said was, are you stupid? Are you just stupid? Can you not follow simple instructions? And man, I saw the spirit just break. And of course, the one of mine that will probably, if there's anybody going to come out of this family, and I don't know what God's going to do, but, but we refer to him as the pastor at the house, and we've been calling that since he was six. And um, so he's standing there looking at me. And I'm like, that's the one that's going to tell mom on me right there. That's, that's the one that's going to report right there. He's going to tell Jesus and mom. You know what I mean? And um, so I said, um, I said, hey, man, everybody up, because I was convicted. I said, dad, just completely. If y'all ever want to know how to be a dad, don't watch this. Right? This is a how not to. Don't be afraid of how not to's. I've learned a lot from how not to's. I want you two sons to know what I just showed you is how not to be a dad. Not how to be a dad, how not to be one. Don't ever do what I just did. And I said, the Lord says don't exasperate your children. We discipline them, but we don't exasperate them. And what I just did is exasperate this whole scene because I lost my cool. And that's sin. And I said, and I, di I didn't say stupid. I said something worse than that. But I don't want to say that on the recording. So anyway, so the six-year-old is here. The eight-year-old's here. Because, you know, they need to learn how to shoot. They're eight. So anyway, so... <laughs> Unbelievable. But anyway, so they're like, what, what, are we part of a militia now? We're eight and six. You know what I mean? But anyway, so, uh, so I say, Lord, forgive me for exasperating my sons. Forgive me for my behavior. Uh, I pray that, uh, you know, that uh, Brooke's head's not cut too bad and I would rather not go to the hospital. And Lord, I pray. For, and I said, I just, just forgive me for the way I behaved. And the six-year-old, better known as the pastor, said, and for saying he's stupid. <laughs> thank you. You are thank you, son. And Lord for saying he's stupid. I forgive. It. So anyway, so but there's some there's some great how not tos, and uh, and we need to learn for those. Number four, uh, an unleader, and, and this is one I thought was surprising. I agree with Ferrari. He said you're gonna be uh, uh, surprised. At this an unleader is not hospitable. I have to admit I've struggled with that. I'm not a very hospitable person. Uh, if, if you if you don't watch me. I'll get out on an island, and, and I certainly don't mind going to things, but I don't really like being the person who's hosting it. You know what I mean? You know, people come into my house. People come into my world. I, I mean, I do it, and I always enjoy it when it happens, but that's not my nature, really. Uh, my, my nature is I, I go home. That's where I go. I don't want people coming to our house. You know, and, of course, my wife, who's very hospitable, is like, what, what is wrong with you? I mean, is something wrong with you? What? You don't like people coming over? Not really. Let's go to where they are. You know, if we want to spend time with them, let's go to where they are. But, but, what, but what, uh, what John is saying is, what he says that this unleader, he says he doesn't welcome the brothers. He's not hospitable. He, he, says, uh, he, he, he said he puts them out of the church. And not only does he not let the apostles come into his home, he tells others not to let us in either. And he said, in these days, you have to understand, we didn't have pasture homes. We didn't have hotels. Those were very hard to find. He said, most of the time, when the church leaders would come to your town and come to your church, you put them up in your home, kind of like we did with the GIC, which I loved, having these pastors in my home. See, I'm hospitable now. <laughs> Sherry signed up for it. I did not, but I was glad. I was glad it happened. You know, when I was first asked about it, I, I thought to myself, oh, gosh, Sherry's already committed. But, but no, it was great, and we had a good time. One year I lost our missionaries, but that was, that was our first year to try. Uh, but anyway, he said that he did not make others 
feel like number one. You know, he didn't take the time. He talked about, remember, he t I love Steve and his transparency in the book, too, when he says his wife gave up their bedroom to her parents, and he got mad about it. Hey, you didn't talk to me about this. Only to realize, I have to talk to you about giving our parents our room? Why, they're at our house, said this when they first got married, and the other thing was just a hideaway bed. You know, he said, my wife was so hospitable, she didn't think she'd have to discuss whether we're going to give up our room to my mom and dad who are like missionaries. You know, because these were these godly man and woman, and he was wrong. He said, but my first reaction was, I don't want to give up our room. Make them sleep on the hideaway bed. <laughs> See, that's not hospitable. He, when you're being hospitable and you're a true leader, you make other people feel like they're number one. I mean, you super serve them. You take care of them. What do you need? Relax. You've been out on, you've been doing ministry all over the world. How far, John, did you have to travel to be with us? Come to my home. My wife will make you. What's your favorite? What do you like to eat? What, we'll get your favorite. You know, like we said with these missionaries that came. You're in America. What's one thing you'd like to have in America? We'll fix it. And, and, and you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, and what, what an unleader does is you're not hospitable. You don't want to be inconvenienced. You don't want to be put out. And you're not going to be put out for anybody. Well, that's not a leader. That's an unleader. And he makes this clear. Number five, he says uh, that what this leads to, an unleader has an unhappy family. <laughs> he said, I don't have any proof that this cat was married or he had kids. He said, but can you imagine what the house was like if he did? Who, who, who Mr. Everybody Serve Me, I don't serve anybody. I got to be number one. I undercut anybody. I gossip. I run people down. I'm negative about everybody. You think he's not, you think he'd be a blast to be married to or that be your daddy? You think he's going to go, be a, a, a tyrant at the Little League field? You think he's going to constantly be talking about how, how the coach is stupid and how he don't know anything and how the school doesn't know what they're doing and well, I'm not going to do this and, and they need us to do that. I ain't doing that. Can you imagine me in your church? He's in a church right here. I bet he was a blast. Don't you know? I, this is just me sidebar over here. Don't you know that when his arrogant butt was sitting there on the front pew or the best seat in the church, and they said, we have a letter from, from John, and he smugs up and says, John will probably be recognizing me in the letter. <laughs> Don't you know when John ate him up in front of everybody, there were people nudging to him going, yes, I've been waiting on this. I hate this guy. You know what I mean? And... Uh, and so he says that God, this is important. He said, don't forget that God speaks in many ways. This is important. Husbands and dads or future husbands and dads here. God speaks through wives and children alongside his word. He will speak to us through his word, no doubt. But he also speaks to us, as you just heard my example, through our wives and our children. Be listening. I've noticed that when I don't... I don't know, what is it about our kids? Can they not get any good trait from us? Just one good trait? I mean, but I've noticed my kids can roll back my bad traits. I'm like, you know, your wife, you ever had your wife just look at you when your kids do something that, that is your problem? I wonder where you got that. <laughs> and you're just like, how do I get blamed for that? How do you get blamed for that? That's you. You do that all the time. No, let me tell you the perfect example. So talking to my son, one time, and I, you know, be careful when you do this, but I would encourage you to do this. And, and it's never too old if you want to go back in time and say, let's talk about some things in the past. Take a time, if you're ever with your children or one of your children, try to get them by themselves, but if, whatever you need to do, and just say, is there anything you don't think I've either done well or do well as a father? Now be careful because, now my son, which was, which was interesting, and I've done this with all of them, they'll, they always do this. You serious? <laughs> I'm serious. Free shot. Go right ahead. Like, we can't get in trouble for this? <laughs> no, no, I'm really trying to learn. I, I really want to know, and I remember this, and, and you, you listen, because this is a problem of mine, and I've gotten, Jesus has changed this. I haven't done anything to change it, but, but Jesus has changed this, and I try to stay away from it. And when my kids do it, this is one of the things my wife goes, and that's you right there. Burgess's rant. We rant. Anybody ever heard me rant on the radio with that? Or ever been around? We ran. If you get me, if I get to going, I ran. I ran as a coach. I've tried to get a lot better about that. I ran as a husband. I ran as a father. I ran as a boss sometimes, and I ran as a friend sometimes. I'll get if I get to ranting, I, buddy. Just just say, well, at some point he'll be exhausted, but he's he's going he's going to get in everything he's got to get in right now. And and my dad ranted, so I learned that from my dad. And and so um, so anyway, so I say to the, one of my sons, I said, uh, what what is something you'd like to see me do better? Are you serious? I'm serious. Go ahead and tell me. Aren't you know when you come downstairs and we got 
water bottles laying everywhere and cups and bags that we didn't throw away. Hmm? Yeah, I, I hate that. We know. <laughs> and he said, you tell us that mom's not a maid. Mm -hmm. He goes, when you come down and tell us to clean it up, we got it. I said, what do you mean? He goes, we got it. The minute you say clean it up, do we not start cleaning it up? You do. Well, why do you keep on t talking to us about it then? I mean, then you go on and on for, for 15 minutes about something that you said to do, and we're doing it. We got it. I said, so you think I ran about that too much? <laughs> yes, I do. And we don't like it. Okay. Let me leave here before I start ranting about you talking about my rant. Uh, but, uh, but, but you know what? That's listening. That's listening. That's feedback that my son say, hey, Dad, if you're going to be a leader, just tell us to do it. Now, if we don't do it, then say, then you can, then, then you can follow up. If you say pick the stuff up and we start picking it up, you can even give us one of those and don't let me see this again. But don't keep, your, your mama's not a maid, and I come down here, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, everybody's going to be kicked out from down here. Nobody's going to be allowed to live down here but me. Y'all going to have to find another place to live. If I, I mean, y'all have water bottles everywhere, bag over here. I want this stuff picked up, and I'll tell you, it just seems like, and he's like, all you said, all you had to do is say pick it up. And you don't want to see it like this anymore. We'll do it. And I really could look at their, at their body of work. They're not tyrannical, you know, children who rise up against authority. They're messy. Teenage boys are messy. And it does get on my nerves. But he said, hey, we got it. So be sure and listen to feedback from, uh, from wives and from children and never think that we're above reproach. And, um, and it says that, um, that I love that John, who was a loving man, talking about this, about this guy, he thought he was so bad, I already said that about you. I already said this about him, but he puts it at the end. He said, John, who was known as the, you know, the, the, the apostle that Jesus loved, he said, but he also was a son of thunder, and you heard him saying, I'm writing this to you, but if I can get there and I see him, I'm going to tell him face to face. Meaning this guy must be, I mean, it's so bad that he thinks the letter's not enough. If, if I get there, I'm going to rebuke him publicly. Look at the name Diotrephes. It actually means nourished by Zeus, because this is a Greek guy. Nourished by Zeus, and of course Zeus was a false god. And he asked this question about our names. What in our lives do we have that are false gods? Power, popularity, fame, the drive to be number one. i got to be number one. Are we looking for the applause of the world? Is that our false god? Because he said this man's name said that he was nourished by Zeus. What are you nourished by? What am I nourished by? He said a, re a true leader and who wants to finish strong must be nourished by Jesus Christ. Not, not any other God. We need to hear what he has to say to us even if his words humble us. Even if, if his words bruise our egos and take us down a couple of notches, the bottom line, being an unleader, is unmanly. Being an unleader is unmanly. Real men serve just like Jesus did. Real men serve just like Jesus did. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for these words. Thank you for these practical things of a small letter from John talking about a man that none of us want to be like. Thank you, Lord, for allowing this example of how not to do things to be in your holy word. And we thank you, John, for making sure that we knew about it. I, I pray, Lord, we take this and we look at ourselves and see if we're more like this man with a name difficult to say, are we more like you? Are we somewhere in between as we assess ourselves today? Be with our brothers who couldn't be here with us. Be with those who are listening to this podcast around the country and around the world as we continue to be sanctified and nourished by you, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Y'all go get them. <laughs>